Welcome to my talk about uh, Apache Kafka. My name is Jakub Scholz. I'm an engineer at Red Hat, and I'm also a maintainer of the project called Strimzy. Uh, and occasionally, I also contribute to Apache Kafka itself. Uh, I hope you all heard about Apache Kafka. That's the kind of leading uh, data streaming, even streaming platform. Uh, I hope you also heard about Strimzy, but if not, Strimzy is a CNCF incubating project, which uh, it's open source, of course, open source community with the Apache 2.0 license. And we focus on running Apache Kafka on uh, Kubernetes by providing set of operators for running all the different uh, Kafka components, but also for managing topics and uh, users. And uh, uh, if you at least a little bit follow what's happening on in uh, the Kafka land, then uh, there's this thing uh, with removing the Apache Zookeeper dependency from Kafka. So uh, yeah, soon the Zookeeper will be gone, the cage will be open, and the Kafka bird will be allowed to fly free. Uh, and uh, it remains to be seen how well it works. Uh, but that's pretty much what I will focus in my talk uh, today. Uh, so if you are not that familiar with it, Zookeeper is used in Kafka for several different uh, things. Uh, one of them is uh, to kind of bootstrap the Kafka cluster, but also to do some coordination of the Kafka nodes. And the other big part of what Zookeeper does for Kafka is that it's used to manage the metadata, with the metadata being things like different configurations, for example, users, topics, and all kind of things like that. And What's Kafka doing is that it's replacing it with something called Craft, which stands for Kafka Raft, and it's basically Kafka's own take on the Raft algorithm, which uh, will be used to handle all the different uh, stuff previously done by Zookeeper. There are several kinds of motivations for this. Uh, one of them is uh, simply to get rid of Zookeeper. So uh, the way it works, today or the way it long worked for a long time that you first had to run the Apache Zookeeper cluster and then based on that you were able to start and run the Apache Kafka cluster. It's, it's not exactly nice, right? Because it means that even if all you want to do is to run Kafka, you still have to run Zookeeper. You need to understand Zookeeper. You need to know how to operate it, how to manage it. Maybe you need to know how to do some bug fixing. You need to understand the source codes and so on. And that's all just for running Kafka. So removing Zookeeper removes a lot of the complexity, simplifies things, and makes it much easier to run and operate. The other part is that Zookeeper has its own share issues as well. One of the things uh, we saw uh, in streams in the last months is uh, some issues with DNS, especially when running in environments such as Kubernetes, where the DNS is kind of often uh, eventually consistent, and uh, Zookeeper sometimes doesn't do a great job in re-resolving the DNS, and that causes it to be stuck, for example. So uh, yeah, getting rid of these issues would be nice as well. And then the other big motivation is around scalability and performance. Uh, Kafka is already super scalable and super performant, but uh, uh, why not make it even better, right? Uh, and what might be really the big difference in terms of the scalability and performance is that not necessarily that your small cluster with just a few gigs of RAM and few CPUs and few topics will somehow suddenly be twice as fast, but it's more about the number of topics and partitions the big clusters for some of the big users can handle. Uh, like instead of tens, thousands, or hundred thousand topic partitions, uh, handling millions of them and so on. Uh, now, you might be thinking, uh, why the hell is this guy talking about it in 2024 when this was uh, announced many, many years back? And you are actually right, because it was announced in 2019. But I'm talking about it because it's still going on. Uh, hopefully, it will be finished soon. <laughs> uh, but basically, it's not taking that long because people would be lazy or not working on it. But it's simply because it's a really huge task. And it's not just about implementing the, the kind of craft logic for replacing the Zookeeper nodes, but also because Zookeeper will be gone, it includes changes to all kind of APIs which originally 
were using Zookeeper, now they have to use Kafka, all kind of command line tools which originally connected to Zookeeper now need to connect to Kafka. And these kind of changes to the APIs, when you want to do them properly through the semantic versioning, through letting people upgrade, giving them some time to use the new API, that alone takes a lot of time. So that's why uh, it's still something what it's in progress today, although it's uh, quite old as an idea. Uh, if you are just running some Kafka consumers and producers, you don't really care whether the cluster is running uh, Craft or whether it's based on Zookeeper. The consumers and producers, they will pretty much work exactly the same for both. But if you are running the Kafka cluster itself, then the change is huge, especially to the architecture of the Kafka cluster. Because uh, the way the Craft stuff is implemented is that the Kafka nodes will now have two different roles. One will be the role of the controller, which is basically what will kind of take over all the Zookeeper responsibilities. And then the second role will be the broker role, which will do pretty much exactly what the brokers were doing in, uh, in the Zookeeper-based cluster, so distributing the messages, storing them, and uh, stuff like that. But what makes it really interesting is that you can mix these roles in the same JVM, in the same process, in the same container. So that gives you kind of a wide range of different architectures where if you start with the, with the simplest one, uh, you have the kind of single node architecture when you have just single pod on Kubernetes, single container, single process, single JVM, and it runs both of the roles. So it has both the controller and the broker role, and it's really all you need to do some Kafka stuff. And uh, it's great, but if you want some things like high availability, reliability guarantees, then obviously you need to kind of scale it up. So one such node isn't enough for you, you will need, for example, three such nodes. So that's kind of what you still see on the, on the left side there. But as you would grow the cluster, then at some point you don't really want to add more of these controller nodes because they need to maintain the the quorum and having too many nodes in the quorum that can make it quite complicated. So you would actually keep adding additional nodes, but they will have only the broker role. So you will kind of get to this architecture in the middle where uh, you have the three mixed nodes, as we call them, with both roles, and then you add additional brokers. And then finally, as your cluster grows and grows, then maybe you want to better isolate the resources for the controllers, for the brokers, and you might want to use the setup which is on the right side, where you have just some controller-only nodes and then broker-only nodes. And uh, this kind of is the architecture which quite closely resembles how the Zookeeper-based cluster work. You just have the Kafka controllers instead of the Zookeeper nodes, and then you have the brokers. The interesting thing is that you want to be able to change between these architectures as your cluster, for example, grows together with your project, product, company. But also, each of these architectures, it's interesting in slightly different use cases. So for example, the, the single node uh, controller and broker, that's, of course, interesting for some kind of testing, development, where you don't want to run some huge cluster just to test some application. But it's also, for example, interesting in some far edge scenarios where someone has some uh, lightweight device somewhere in the middle of the forest or some field in agriculture and runs there a simple Kafka cluster with this setup. But then again, at the, at the edge use cases, maybe on the near edge, the solution with the free mix nodes with the high availability, that's quite interesting. But the mix nodes and the architecture in the middle, they are also interesting, for example, if you run Kafka on bare metal and you have only some big servers with a lot of resources, and the controllers alone, they don't consume so many resources. So if you use the mixed nodes, you can kind of better utilize the hardware you have instead of having some servers running on 5% of their performance. And uh, you can kind of save some costs that way. So that's why in Streamsy we want to support all of these different architectures. And uh, we want the users to be also able to transition between them. Uh, of course, if you are running a Zookeeper-based cluster today, then we don't want to leave you behind, right? So there is a migration process 
which allows you to migrate the existing Zookeeper-based clusters to uh, the Craft-based clusters. And uh, it's kind of a multi-stage process where you go through several stages to migrate all the metadata to the Craft forum. Uh, there are some caveats which are kind of important to understand. The, the first one is that you can migrate only to the dedicated controller node, so to the architecture which was on the, on the right side of the slide. Uh, and uh, if you want to use the mixed nodes, you would kind of need then, once you are running craft, you would need to migrate to the mixed nodes architecture. Uh, the possibilities for the rollback are also a little bit limited. Uh, you can roll back during the different stages of the migration process, but once you are running the actual craft cluster, there's no simple way back to Zookeeper. So once you are running craft, then you are running craft and there's not much space to change your mind. And finally, what's quite important is that the migration will be supported only for a limited time. And with that, I don't necessarily mean that you have to migrate till the end of this year or you will be stuck with Zookeeper forever. But what I mean is that the migration will be supported only in the 3.x Kafka versions that will support both Craft and Zookeeper. But in Kafka 4.0, when Zookeeper will be removed, then you cannot do the migration, for example, as part of the Kafka upgrade. So you need to, if you are using today Kafka 3.7, then you will not be able, with Zookeeper, you will not be able to upgrade from it to, for example, Kafka 4.5, two years later, after you think that the craft stuff is mature enough. What you will need to do is you will need to migrate to craft within the 3.7 Kafka version, and only then, once you are running craft, you can upgrade to Kafka 4.5, for example. So that's important because there's a lot of people who are like, uh, yeah, we don't want to use the craft stuff too early, we want to wait, we want to wait, but at the end, you will still need to migrate uh, to craft within these uh, Kafka free something versions. So I hope that gave you kind of a introduction to what the craft means for, for Kafka and the Zookeeper removal. I want to also talk a bit about the challenges we were facing in Strimzy while implementing this, uh, this stuff. Uh, some of them are quite, uh, quite obvious. Uh, as I showed in the timeline, it's basically going on for five years now, so it's not like there's one huge PR which will be merged one day and then it will be gone, right? Uh, there's many smaller steps, features are being implemented one by one, so there's a lot of situations where some feature is implemented, but other is missing, so you need to apply all kind of workaround uh, to use these new features, to use craft, then you need to rework it next release to kind of adapt the next feature and so on. Uh, of course, with the amount of work which is happening there in Kafka, there are also many bugs to deal with. But uh, to be honest, something what I found quite challenging with it was what I call premature production readiness. Uh, uh, Kafka called craft production ready quite early from my perspective with many missing features which I think are quite important for running it in production. But it created kind of a lot of pressure on us because we had a lot of users coming and saying, hey, this Kafka project says that the craft is already production ready, why don't you fully support it yet? And we had to invest a lot of energy to explain to people that this is missing, that is missing, that is missing, and that doesn't allow us easily to kind of implement it and support it. And the other issue we faced a lot and we kind of still face today is that a lot of the work around craft is not operationalized. What does that mean? That means that a lot of the stuff is kind of designed in the way, hey, you do a step, then you watch some log somewhere going out from the Kafka process, and then when you see there some message, then you do the next step. And this is something that's really hard to automate uh, uh, with some tools, some scripts, uh, something like Strimzy, uh, because the, the logs are really hard to capture, really hard to, to kind of do that reliably. So it was missing all kind of these APIs, tools, metrics for doing these things uh, in automated fashion, and that's uh, quite challenging for us as well. Uh, some of the challenges were unique for Strimzy uh, and not really related to Kafka itself. One of that was that uh, 
the way the craft is designed with all these different kind of nodes and processes that creates what I call asymmetric node configurations. And the way the Kubernetes workflow APIs are designed, it's not really easy to handle these different architectures and the transitions between them. And I will get uh, back to it in the next slide. But another thing which was quite hard for us was that in the, in the topic operator, which we have for managing the Kafka topics, we relied quite heavily on, on Zookeeper to provide us notifications about some changes to the Kafka cluster configuration. And Kafka itself in Craft actually doesn't offer anything comparable to this feature. You can't really watch for any changes, which is a bit funny. It's streaming platforms, streaming events, but you actually cannot kind of receive a stream of the events with the changes to the Kafka configuration. Uh, so we had to work around this by basically completely redesigning the topic operator from, from scratch to make it work somehow. Now, going back to the, to the challenges around the different architectures, when running Zookeeper, the strimsy based Kafka cluster looks something like this. You have the three Zookeeper nodes forming the Zookeeper cluster, and then you have, for example, the three Kafka brokers doing the Kafka part. And it's quite easy. They each have their own ID. So you can have, for example, Zookeeper node with ID 1 and Kafka broker with ID 1. They have their own sequence. They don't really kind of conflict with each other. They have each their own storage or resources configuration. So when you run this on Kubernetes, it fits pretty nicely into the stateful set API. Because you can create a stateful set for the Zookeeper cluster with the Zookeeper configuration and a stateful set for the Kafka cluster with the Kafka configuration. And it was quite nice fit. But now with the craft, it's a bit harder because you have only these uh, Kafka nodes, the Kafka nodes, they are all numbered from one sequence. So each of the Kafka nodes needs to have a unique number, but they have very different configurations. So for example, here I have the three brokers first. They will have a lot of resources and a lot of storage. Then I have another three nodes, which are these mixed nodes with the broker and controller role. So the process inside the pod will have a different configuration, but I still have quite a lot of resources as a storage and memory and CPU. Then I have again three brokers with the broker configuration. And then at the end, I have two controller only nodes. You can imagine this as a, a cluster, which is just in a transition from the mixed controller nodes to the controller only nodes, for example. And uh, the controller nodes, they have now completely different configuration because they are configured only as a controller but they also don't need so many resources such as storage or CPU and memory. So you can't easily create a single stateful set in Kubernetes and represent it with it, but because of the numbering and kind of changing the roles, changing the architectures for the different nodes, you can't also create four different stateful sets for that that easily. So uh, yeah, we had to deal with this and uh, the way we dealt with it was that we simply had to stop using the stateful sets. And uh, we started managing the pods in the Kubernetes cluster ourselves. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, we introduced something what's called Kafka node pools, which allow the users who are managing and running the Kafka cluster kind of create different sets of the Kafka nodes with the different configurations. So you can have the Kafka node pool for the brokers, for the controllers, and so on. And uh, we, of course, had to do this while maintaining the backwards compatibility, maintaining the upgradability, so that kind of the users can move to that from the older version. So yeah, that, uh, that alone, even without the craft, was actually quite a lot of work and uh, quite a big challenge. So how does it look like is uh, if you deploy these different types of nodes, you can basically create a Kafka node pool for, for each of them, which exactly specifies the different configuration for the resources, for the roles, uh, and uh, everything related. So this way you can kind of assemble the Kafka cluster from the different node pools, which have the different roles. Now, uh, maybe it will be a bit easier to understand from a demo. So uh, let me switch to the command line and show you some YAMLs. Uh, so I actually already deployed my Kafka cluster, but I will show you the 
file which I used to deploy it. So this is the custom resource which I used to create the Kafka cluster. So this Kafka custom resource. And that existed in Strumzy already before, but now it basically configures only the shared things which apply to the whole Kafka cluster. So you can, for example, see here, because today we still support both Zookeeper and Craft-based clusters. We use this annotation to tell the operator that this should use uh, Craft. We specify the versions which it should use. We specify the listeners, some configurations. But what you might see that it doesn't contain anything like a number of replicas, storage configuration, and resources configuration. That's here in this uh, second resource, which uh, has the kind Kafka node pool. And it has the name Kafka. A label specifies that it belongs to the Kafka cluster named My Cluster. And then here we specify the roles which these nodes should have. So they should be both controller and broker. We specify the number of replicas. So we want three such nodes. And we specify the stuff such as resources or storage. And uh, basically, when I applied it, then you get what you can see here. Here I have running the, the streams operator. And I have the free Kafka nodes, exactly as I specified it in the node pool. And they have the mixed roles. I have uh, the entity operator, which is for managing the topics and users. I have cruise control for cluster balancing. And then I have here some consumer and producer to kind of give it some load. And that's working fine. If you remember the slide with the architectures, we are kind of on the left side of it, where we are running three nodes with both roles. And what I can do now is uh, I can simply go and create another node pool. So this time I will call it broker. I have here some special annotations to kind of help you manage the node IDs and help you make a bit order like all the brokers are IDs 100 plus. All the controllers are IDs between 0 and 99. So I can use those to control it. And then in the roles, I specify only the broker role. So I want this to be only brokers. And then I again say I want to have three such nodes. And I specify the resources and storage. Now when I do kubectl apply on it, Then the operator will see it, and you can see that right here it's now starting the, the new broker node. So this way we are kind of moving into the architecture which was in the middle of the slide, where we have three nodes with the mixed roles, and then we have three additional nodes with the broker roles. Now it will take a few seconds to get the brokers up and running and ready. But once they are started, they basically won't do anything because I have my consumer and producer already deployed, and they are running on the mixed nodes. So the next thing I will need to do is I will need to move some load to these nodes so that they have actually some work to do. And uh, maybe later I want to transition to the controller-only nodes. So what I want to do is uh, that I want to use cruise control and this uh, rebalance resource with which I can basically instruct the cruise control project, the cruise control container, to prepare some new organization of the topic partitions on top of the Kafka cluster, so that it moves all the data from the, uh, from the brokers 0, 1, and 2. These are the, the mixed nodes with the, with the controller and broker role. And by telling it to remove these brokers, then it will basically move these data to the new nodes which I just started, to the nodes 100, 101, 102. So I'm going to do. Again, kubectl apply on it. And we can uh, watch as the rebalance is happening. So you see that it's already rebalancing. Now, uh, this is the tricky part of the demo, because this might take 30 seconds. It might also take uh, like five minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch back into the slides and continue with the slides. And then at the end, we will get back to the, to the demo. So while the cluster is rebalancing, the next thing I wanted to cover are some of the risks which I can see uh, in, uh, in the way we decided to implement the craft support. Uh, one of them is about getting rid of the stateful set and managing the pods ourselves. Because that basically means we cannot rely anymore on the Kubernetes stateful set controller to kind of spawn the pods for us for the, for the Kafka nodes 
when some ugly events happen, such as uh, worker node crash, availability zone crash somewhere in AWS, or maybe there's some eviction. And all these things, uh, the managing and the creation of the pods, it's now Streams' responsibility, and we cannot rely on Kubernetes. So we have to make sure that it is hardened properly, we have high availability in the operator, and things like that to be able to guarantee that the cluster survives these events. Also, what I guess is a bit risk is I showed you how we use the Kafka and the Kafka node pool resources. So basically, to create a Kafka cluster, you will kind of need to combine them. Uh, it's not completely unique for Streamsy to do this. I know there are other projects uh, doing something similar, but it's definitely a departure from what we were doing before. So uh, yeah, I hope the users will kind of get used to it and uh, get familiar with it. Uh, just to summarize where we are today, so the last available Streamsy version uh, is 041. That's what I'm using in the demo as well. So it supports all of the things I talked about, uh, the migration. It supports JBot storage in, uh, in Craft. Uh, it supports the migration both from Zookeeper to Craft, but also to some extent within the different Kafka architectures, like what I'm showing in the, in the demo. Uh, but there are still some limitations. Uh, some of them are in Strumzy, but some of them are still in uh, Apache Kafka itself. So, for example, the scalability of the controller node is not really supported today, at least not if you want to keep the cluster fully functional while scaling the controllers. So that's one of the limitations. And uh, another one is that, uh, for example, the unclean leader election is not yet supported. I think that in general for many people, this is not necessarily a blocking issue for production because these things are relatively rare and you don't really do them on a regular basis. Scaling the controllers, that's normally a, quite a major change which would be pretty unusual. And hopefully this will be addressed uh, later this year. But yeah, right now they are still there. So uh, yeah, it's good to be aware of them. Uh, I want to also get back to the, to the timeline. Uh, and uh, talk a bit more about what's, uh, what's towards the end of the timeline. Uh, so actually, right now in the Kafka community, there's war going on on the Kafka 3.8 release. Uh, and funny enough, uh, three days ago, the plan was that the next release will be Kafka 4.0, which will already have dropped the Zookeeper support. But actually, as of yesterday or today, it looks like there will be Kafka 3.9 release, uh, which will still happen during the summer, which will bring some of these limitations, which I mentioned, like the controller scalability and the unclean leader election. And uh, then the Kafka 4.0 release, right now it's still planned to be uh, later this year, during autumn, October, November, something like that. But uh, hopefully that gives you idea that all these things, all these dates are a bit in flux and subject to change. Uh, uh, in a way that you prepare a presentation and it changes before you present it. But at the end, after Kafka 4.0 is, uh, is released, uh, we will uh, have to basically sooner or later drop the Zookeeper support in Streamsy as well. What we will try to do is that we will try to have the last version of Streamsy with the Zookeeper support as a kind of LTS support and do the bug fixing and uh, CV fixing there for a bit longer. And I think Kafka will try to do the same, but yeah, I guess it remains to be seen uh, how long will that be. But yeah, you can't really stop the train, I guess, whether you want to or not. So uh, yeah, we will all be in the craft land pretty soon. And that's it for the slides, but I want to get back to the, to the demo, which in the meantime, we can see that the rebalance moved to ready, and that means that the all three nodes with the mixed roles, they are now, uh, now empty. And what I can do is uh, I can do kubectl edit Kafka node pool Kafka. And I can find the configuration for the, for the roles. And I can simply delete from it the broker role. And I can apply the changes. And what you see here is that it now started rolling the, the Kafka node, and uh, they will now not be the brokers anymore. They will be controllers only. So that way, we kind of finish the migration from the, from, uh, the mixed node 
to the controller only node. So basically when I get back to the slides, what we did in the demo is uh, something like this. This is where we st started with the free mixed nodes and then we added the free broker nodes to it. And then finally at the end, we kind of changed the mixed nodes to the controller only nodes. And now we have the Kafka cluster running in the architecture with uh, the controller only nodes and the brokers. And uh, yeah, you have to trust me on it because I wasn't really showing the client consuming the messages, but yeah, it basically happened without any, any outages. The, the clients were working through this without any issues. And that's it basically. So I think we should have uh, time for some questions. Yeah? So the question was, which architectures are supported? Uh, so Kafka itself is written in, uh, in Java, so it can pretty much work everywhere. But the thing is that it's inside using some native libraries for, for compressions. Uh, so it definitely works on x86, it works on ARM, it works on Power, it works on S390X or whatever it is. I think it will work on some other architectures as well, but I don't really know all the list for Kafka itself. In, in, in Strimzy, the operator is actually written in Java as well, but in Strimzy we have images for the four I mentioned as well. So x86, ARM, PPC64, LE, and S390X, 380X. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Uh, so the question was if we considered uh, any other consensus protocols than Raft. Uh, so just to make it clear, nobody asked me. <laughs> uh, uh, I think Kafka did some of this kind of leader management and leader election itself already uh, while using Zookeeper for some of the things. So they, as far as I understood it, they pretty much reused this. Uh, and I'm not aware about any big discussion about uh, some other protocols. What was to some extent discussed, there was some discussion whether, for example, instead of doing this in Kafka itself, whether the zookeeper should be, for example, replaced by something like ETCD as a kind or making it pluggable maybe. So that was definitely discussed. I remember that, but that was uh, rejected because, yeah, I. I think it would be quite chaos if someone was using, running Kafka with ETCD, someone with Zookeeper, someone with, I think Consul can do pretty much the same stuff as well. So, so I think that would be quite chaos. And uh, yeah, I think the idea to remove the external dependency completely was, uh, was quite good. But I, I personally don't remember any big discussions about the algorithm. The question to shorten it up a bit uh, was whether I expect the craft stuff to really work or be full of bugs and so on. I guess that kind of covers it, right? Yeah. Uh, now is the time where I want to ask for my lawyer. <laughs> uh, so, I, I, like, I don't know. I think it was used to, as I said, it was used to some extent already before. So it's, yeah, some of that is reused and was already used before. I think the community did quite a lot of testing. Uh, Confluent, the, the company which did a lot of the work on the, on the Zookeeper removal in the Kafka project, uh, I think they even shared some numbers like how many thousand times they tried to do something and so on. Uh, but it's software as any other, right? So there can be always bugs, uh, there can be always problems uh, and uh, yeah, the best way how to make sure there won't be is that uh, yeah, maybe not everyone jumps right today to use it in production, but that more and more people start to test it in their test environments to kind of see how it works in their environments with their configuration, with their latencies, with their networking issues and so on. And 
I think that's at the end the only way to help us uh, get more and more confident that this will work. But yeah, hope that somehow answers it. Uh, any other questions? Looks like not, so I guess that's it. Thanks for coming.